Welcome to another top grade video. Today we're cooking up an answer, an essay plan that is going to fit any question that could come up in 2024, but it will also fit any question that ever comes up. My prediction is that you will have human nature as the theme, but whatever the theme is, good, evil, Christianity, masculinity, it's all the same. It really is just another way of looking at the human condition. And then my character question is Jack. It might not be Jack, there's probably a 50% chance, but this plan is going to fit both essays exactly. When I teach you how that works, you will then be able to apply it to any other question, for example, on Simon or Ralph. Let's crack on with what are we cooking? The thesis statement, that's where you're gonna get your grade nine beginning. There are three questions that I think Golding is asking in this novel. Question number one, is human nature inherently evil or can we become good? Question number two, actually, is the book not about human nature, but actually about male nature, masculinity? Is he only talking about boys? And question number three, is the book arguing that war is inevitable because the boys arrive due to a nuclear explosion damaging their evacuation aircraft and at the end they are rescued by a cruiser that is taking them back into the theatre of war. You can see the symbolism here, the circular structure. Okay, the choir. This introduces Jack, it introduces the idea of evil at the same time as good. Choir obviously sings in church, but the uniform is black. It's suggestive of sinister military uniforms, for example, the SS, but it's also really addressing the problem of why we wear uniforms in the first place, to depersonalize what we do and to allow us to act in harsher and crueler ways with impunity or by justifying the actions to ourselves. It was just part of my role. The uniform proves it. This gives us the duality of these boys and human nature. On the one hand, we're attracted to freedom and innocence, but on the other hand, we're attracted to order and punishment. This is an ironic portrayal of Jack, who starts out as the leader of the choir and therefore potentially the most innocent character, who then becomes potentially, though I'm going to make a claim for Roger, the most evil character. Then we come to number two, the beast. The beast is introduced as a result of a dream, but it is articulated by Jack. So he plays on the fears of the boys instinctively, it seems, in order to gain control. We also have the Christian imagery of it being like a snake thing. Obviously, that's a parallel to the serpent and original sin in the Garden of Eden, which brings us back to Golding's question. Is religion right? Is Christianity right? Are we all born with the capacity for evil? But more than that, the evil of our founding fathers, Adam and Eve, does that live on in us so that we can never fully escape it, can only try to control it. Then we come to Jack. He is the character who has the knife. Now, obviously, this wouldn't have been unusual in a boy in the 1940s. However, Golding gives it specifically to him. This makes him more powerful, but it also symbolises his desire for violence and control. It's significant that we first meet the knife when he's first trying to kill the pig, but he can't do it. Lots in the novel up to this point gives us a veneer of civilization, symbolised by the knife, symbolised by the clothes, that the boys gradually strip away, and then we will later see that Jack can kill the pigs. Next, we have Jack's dislike of Piggy and how the other boys don't all rally round Piggy, even though he's incredibly helpful to them. Piggy represents rational thought. He has a scientific mind. He also represents the feminine. 
He looks after the other boys. He wants to know who they are. He's always thinking about the interests of the others. But the male power of Jack dislikes and distrusts the feminine. Golding has to do this in a subtle way because he hasn't introduced any girls onto the island. So he needs to discuss the idea of femininity in a different way. And here he suggests that masculine behaviour deliberately excludes women and looks down on them, exploits them. He's also different. He's got asthma. He's fat. He symbolises what students of literature call the other, the unknown or the unfamiliar, and therefore he's easier to reject. You can easily see the parallels between how the Nazis looked at other groups that they wanted to demonise and dehumanise. OK, we then get to the sow. It comes straight after my discussion of Piggy because the sow is female. You can see the link. Piggy feminine, Piggy female. And when we look at the description of how that sow is killed by the boys, it is deliberately sexualised. I'm not going to put that in the video now. But it's a very sexualized description. And again, Golding is pointing out that violence also leads to sexual violence. The way that we bring up boys in the 1940s, he's suggesting, will make them much more likely to be abusive to others and to treat women with a complete lack of care and lack of respect. It is, again, a rejection of the feminine. If we think about it as a rejection of the rational as well, well, the last pig that you'd want to kill is one that's producing more pigs. Doesn't make any sense, if you like, in terms of the economy of the island. Then we have the death of Simon. So Simon's death is, of course, a tragedy, but it's written in religious, Christian religious symbolism. So he works out that the beast isn't real. This is quite interesting because in terms of the symbolism of the novel, Simon is suggesting evil, an external force of evil, isn't real. There's no Satan. The external force is a projection of our own fears, our own evil, and so it's us. Simon is also suggesting it's only fear that's making us evil, and if we stop being afraid, we will no longer be evil. Human nature doesn't have to be evil, it's only fear that makes us so. If we go back to the origin story of the beast, you can see that that came out of fear. He gives us this quote about the man on the hill. This is the dead parachutist, but the choice of wording reminds us of Jesus being crucified on the hill in Jerusalem. So it's a clear Christian reference. And then we look at the way that he's killed. Oh, it's a ripping of tooth and claw. Now, this suggests very strongly that all the boys haven't just attacked him with their fingernails. They've also bitten him. And this is a parody of the transubstantiation. So when Christians drink the uh, red wine in the communion and they eat the wafer, the red wine symbolises Jesus's blood and the wafer symbolises his body. In the Catholic Church, it's supposed to miraculously, as you drink it and eat it, turn into Jesus's blood and Jesus's body. So you can see how this is being parodied right here with the killing of Simon. So Jesus died in order to save mankind from sin. And Golding is suggesting, is it ironic or is it real, that Simon is dying in order to save these boys from sin and evil. We look at the description of his body floating in the water amongst the phosphorescent creatures, and it strongly alludes to the idea that his body is like a soul being taken up to heaven. But it's contrasted, juxtaposed with this horrific image of him being killed. So on the one hand, Simon's death introduces hope that there is salvation because it replays the story of Christianity. But on the other hand, it parodies that story and undermines it and invites us to ask, 
Is Christianity therefore a complete illusion, a fiction? Is there actually no hope of salvation? Golding doesn't tell us, but his book allows us to think which way is the story taking us? That discussion, obviously, easy grade nine. Then we get to the Christian symbolism of the parachutist leaving, taking these steps, walking on water, symbolic of another miracle from Jesus. So, yes, that gives us the Christian symbolism of salvation, but if we want to look at it the other way, the parachutist is leaving, abandoning the boys. There is no God to look after them. So you choose which interpretation of that you prefer. Then we have the killing of Piggy. So it links straight back to the othering of him, the rejection of his rationality and his femininity. But it also introduces Roger's power. Roger is now beyond control. He is truly evil. So even if not all the boys on the island are evil, because they have allowed the evil of Roger to find a voice and take control, he becomes unstoppable and so does the power of evil. From this moment on, well actually you might even argue from the killing of Simon on, all other future deaths are possible because they are no longer seen as beyond the realms of what boys can do. They've all participated in this one and so they're all going to allow this one. And that suggests that man is in a continual decline, a spiral of increasing violence and evil. Now you can see, obviously, the parallels with the Second World War and Golding's fears, not just Golding's, but society's fears, that this would then become a Third World War, which would be far more fatal because we now had proof of the destructive power of the atomic bombs. Right. Next, we have the fire to kill Ralph. This is where all rational thought, killed with Piggy, has completely disappeared. So yes, lighting the fire will flush Ralph out, but it will also lead to the destruction of the island, the destruction of all their food sources, and therefore eventual death, potentially, to all the boys. And yet, they're happy to have mutual self-destruction in order to focus on their enemy and their joy of killing. So the message is, war appears like a moral choice, it appears like the thing to do, but the consequence of war could be so much destruction that it gives you a Pyrrhic victory. Pyrrhic refers to a fire and it's a metaphor for a victory which burns you. So yes, you win the battle, but the cost of the battle is so great that it's the equivalent to losing. And that's what the fire is doing here. They will kill Ralph if the cruiser and the officer doesn't appear because he's got nowhere to escape, but then that victory will also lead to their own deaths. So that gives us the stick sharpened at both ends. On the one hand, it's because it's going to be planted into the earth with Ralph's head on. But on the other hand, it's damaging at both ends, both to the person holding it, the boys, and symbolically Jack, who's going to be on the other end of it. So we're destroying ourselves through our fears, through our propensity for evil, through our attraction towards tyrannical leaders like Jack and the power they unleash like Roger, but that ultimately this will destroy everyone in society. Then we come to number 10, the ending. And this is a wonderful part of the novel to write about. It's full of ironic symbolism where the officer arrives to rescue the boys. The first irony is that the fire that's destroying the island actually works as a symbol, as a signal even, that saves them because that's what leads the cruiser to come and get them. So this could be an optimistic ending. Despite the awfulness of violence and war and evil, there is hope for the boys and society because they're going to survive. Set against that, you've got the irony of the circular structure. They're not just being taken onto any boat, they're being taken onto a cruiser, a boat of war. They're being taken back 
into the war and that's what they're going to be educated into. That would suggest that Jack's approach with violence is what he's going to get educated in and all the boys are as they grow older and Ralph's idea of fair play is and democracy is not going to be what they get rescued into. So Golding is making us wonder what is the world in the future that they're going to? Is it going to be more like Jack's version of democracy that ultimately fails on the island or is it going to be Jack's version of tyranny that is ultimately self-destructive? And then we have the symbolism of the officer dressed in white suggesting innocence and purity where actually we can see the officer is deceiving himself. He looks at what's happened on the island and he just talks about them being boys putting on a good show and he doesn't address the fact that they've tried to murder each other. So that is my plan. It's dealt with human nature. But what if the question is about Jack? We're not going to leap around the novel trying to find other bits. There are lots of other bits that will fit, so you can do, but I'm trying to show you how this one plan will fit any question. So with Jack, well, brilliant, we've started with him there. He introduced that, that's easy. He introduced that, it's easy. It's him that dislikes Piggy, that's easy. It's him that kills the sow, that's easy. He participates in the death of Simon here. And here we're going to say that Jack is just like the other boys. So he isn't a man apart. His evil that we've seen here and propensity for violence that we've seen here is actually just an expression of what many of the boys already have inside them. No, not many, all of them, because Piggy points out they all participated. The Christian symbolism of walking on water, Jack doesn't notice. None of the other boys notice. So we're going to include that to say that the reader has noticed, but the island has already abandoned Christianity. So this would then link to the idea, has God abandoned them or not? The killing of Piggy, let's look at it from Jack's perspective. It's not something he's asked for, but he is then powerless to prevent Roger. So we're now looking at the idea that even the supreme ruler is no longer as powerful as the forces he unleashes. So if in order to achieve power, you turn to violence and destruction, then there will be more violence that you cannot control that will ultimately potentially destroy you. Then we have the fire to kill Ralph. And we've already talked about how this is a symbol of everything that is irrational. And so now Jack symbolizes everything that is irrational. And Golding is pointing out that dictatorship, which Jack symbolizes, is an ir irrational reaction to political and social problems. Then we have the improbable rescue. And you're going to ask yourself, why doesn't Jack say he's the one in charge? Does this mean his power is now over? Or does it mean that it's quite subtle? He doesn't have to say he's in charge because the society he's going into will reward people like Jack and not people like Ralph. You can flip it the other way around and say no. The order of public schools and fair play and democracy is restored in Ralph saying that he's the leader and the officer taking his word and then taking him off to a society that might reflect those British values and not the violence of destruction, tyranny and dictatorship. OK, well, what if the question isn't on Jack, but it's on Simon? How on earth would you make it fit there? Well, Simon comes from this background but he tries to escape it. He gets rid of his cloak. He's not interested in control. He becomes solitary. Simon is like a Christian visionary about how we can all live in peace. Ironically, however, he's going to be killed off. So Golding rejects Simon's approach as a route into salvation. 
Simon disproves the beast. So we got the beast there and he disproves it later on. But no one listened to that proof. He's powerless because he cannot communicate well with the other boys. And so that brings us to a discussion of whether good news is ever welcome. If you ever watch the news, it's always negative. We're far more likely to react to negative stuff. That's why he gets killed off. He doesn't have the power to survive. The desire to be good is therefore fragile. It's not enough to overcome the human evil or the masculine idea of control and destruction. The dislike of Piggy. Simon doesn't do anything to protect Piggy. So is it enough to be good or do you have to act in good ways and stand up to evil? That's a question that Simon asks us. Instead, he becomes kind of isolated. Then we have the killing of the sow. Does Simon participate in this? I don't think he does. So he rejects violence, but that violence will still turn on him and kill him. So the pacifist approach isn't necessarily one that's going to work. Is Golding suggesting that when we do have a threat from abroad, a threat of war, that we have to produce our own evil and combat it? Or is he suggesting, no, if we were all like Simon, we wouldn't all get killed, that we would still survive the war? I think the novel suggests that you do have to stand up, that being good is not enough. You do also have to tap into that inner evil. But feel free to disagree with me. We've got the Christian symbolism. Obviously, that's all linked to Simon, as is the man on the hill. The killing of Piggy happens after Simon's death. So how could we make that relevant? Well, because the killing of Simon gives permission for the killing of Piggy. So once goodness is wiped off the island, then evil can flourish. The fire to kill Ralph, Simon has nothing to do with, but we can see this as another form of rescue. Simon was trying to rescue the boys from their own fears. This is the consequences of their own fears, but ironically and miraculously, that also leads to their rescue. So we could argue that Simon's desire to rescue the boys is the same desire that's present in society, it's the same desire that causes the cruiser to change course, running towards the fire. Because after all, the fire could have been the source of a battle, could have been the source of an enemy, but they still go there in the hope that they will be able to find something like the boys, where they can do good, where they can rescue. So that gives us a much more optimistic version of the ending. So that's how to do it. You have... 10 key moments in the novel, and you keep going back to those and applying them to your character. Remember the top marks are for explaining Golding's purpose. That's why the thesis was so important. And your conclusion when you deal with the ending is really going to ask these questions about the future. Is this an optimistic ending that we're expected to feel joyful about? Or is it a pessimistic ending which suggests that society will continue to deteriorate? I'm not going to tell you which answer is right because that's not how literature works. But the discussion will give you the grade nine. Now, the next video you'll want to watch is my prediction for last year's exam, which also shows you how to structure an essay.